Hello again, everybody. And today we're going to talk about uh, sensory evaluation, quality product, and targeted characteristics. Because uh, in order to evaluate something, you need to know how to evaluate it, to what standards, uh, and by what descriptions. So, uh, what what is a quality product? That can be a very subjective question. Uh, it can also be a very objective question. Uh, so a product that tastes as expected across the life of a single batch and across all batches. So what that means is you brew a beer and the entire time that that beer is either on draft or in a package, in a can, or any other package that you may do, that product should taste the same on day one until it sells out, you know, day 90, day 120, it uh, doesn't matter. Obviously you want that to go as quickly as possible because most products, most beer products are better or fresher, but a quality product will taste the same from day one to the day that quad, that batch sells out. Uh, also, a quality product will taste the same across multiple batches. Uh, now with small batch breweries that don't have the ability to blend, like us, like uh, a number of small breweries across the state of Kentucky, <clears throat> sometimes there's going to be a little bit of variation in that just happens, it's the nature of small batch crafted quality product. For the most part though, almost everything that you're going to do is going to taste the same batch to batch. It should, because that's a sign of a quality product, a quality process, a quality beer. Now, your objective numbers might be a little different, the gravity, the bitterness might range just a little bit. And, and that's something to be said, um, and that's what happens when you're dealing, you're making a product with a variable raw ingredient, basically. Uh, batches of wheat, batches of barley are going to range season to season based on weather conditions. Uh, take the 2020 barley harvest, uh, it was pretty poor based on drought conditions. So we're going to see possibly a little less sugar per pound. It's just something that happens. It's trying to create a quality consistent product from raw ingredients that are uh, by their definition variable. That's part of the challenge and that's something that you have to do as a brewer. Another definition of a quality product is a product that meets your customers expectations every single time what that customer is going to expect every single time they purchase a product, they purchase beer from you, is huge. Because they're the one handing you their money for the product that you make. Uh, if it doesn't meet their expectation every time, by definition, it's not a quality product. So that is, you can measure something objectively all you want. If the product isn't bought by a customer, it doesn't matter. So you want to make sure that you're meeting your customer's expectations every single time with every purchase. And the role of sensory evaluation and quality, and I'm sure we hit this pretty, pretty well in the first lecture, it's paramount. Every single step in a brewery, every single step of brewing a beer, you should be evaluating for quality. It is most important. And that's the only way you're going to get any kind of consistency in a product is by evaluating yourself and constantly striving for better. And again, sensory analysis checks must be within specifications. So those are ranges that you've decided that you'll mark as acceptable. So like I said, even if they're arbitrarily defined by the head brewer, there are certain things that you want your beer during the process to meet. And that's something that you need to figure out if you're the one creating the recipe. Or that's something that you need to follow if you're following the recipe of your head brewer or anything else. It's meeting certain objective criteria, so that's going to be things like bitterness, 
gravity and temperature during fermentation. Those are things that you've got to meet. And merging certain objective and subjective criteria set by style guidelines and customer expectations. So style guidelines we'll get into a little more. Customer expectations are always changing, I would say. Uh, but at the same time, they're constant. How's that for consistency? <laughs> so targeted characteristics again. We're looking at style guidelines. This is not an all-inclusive list. These are just common ones that I see myself. Uh, BJCP, so Beer Judge Certification Program, and uh, the GABF or World Beer Cup uses the Brewers Association style guidelines. And customer expectations. There are certain things customers are going to expect when you call something a certain thing. If you call your beer an IPA, it better be hoppy. You know? If you call your beer a Hefeweizen, it better be cloudy and it better have those two main flavors you're looking for, banana and clove. Anything other than that is not going to meet your customer's expectations of what you've set up in the description of your beer. So if we're going to run through some of the more common styles as defined by uh, the Beer Judge Certification Program guidelines of 2015, uh, I believe they are updating those due to be out soon. I don't know exactly when that is, um, probably 2022 sometime. Hopefully we'll get some more styles, uh, more things to find, and it's, it's interesting to see what they change from year to year. Well, not year to year, but style there. Addition to addition, we'll say. Uh, so we'll see here, American Light Lager, probably one of the, the most common beer in the United States, of course. And we'll, we'll go through these. So American Light Lager, and we're going to hit the main points of the descriptors. <clears throat> and these are things that you can read a little more exhaustively if you go through. They have an app, BJCP has an app, or you can just go online and check them out and read through the descriptors. They also have objective ranges of measurements. Uh, we're going to deal with more of the subjective stuff since we're dealing more with sensory evaluation. Uh, so the aroma on American Light Lager should be pretty much non-existent, uh, lowly perceived as grainy or corn-like, and that depending on the adjunct that's used. Uh, typically it's either going to be corn or rice, or possibly both. So you would probably want a little bit of aroma from that adjunct, a little bit of corn, a little bit of rice. Flavor is going to be neutral, low grain, low corn, rice, little hop flavor, little hop flavor, lightly bittered. Uh, this style is specifically designed to be as flavorless as possible, uh, served as cold as possible, and appealing to as many people as possible. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast. <clears throat> so mouthfeel should be very light, almost watery, uh, and highly carbonated. Uh, a high carbonation may or may not be something you're used to or see very often if you go and get it on draft. Sometimes you people that have draft systems that share uh, regulators across multiple beers, they have to all carbonate to the same level eventually. It's just a very light, spritzy, uh, flavorless lager. Examples of which are Bud Light, Coors Light, Miller Light, all of the mass-produced light beers. Counterpoint to that style is Czech Pilsner. Uh, the original Pilsner created by Pilsner Urkel, which is the original Pilsner. Uh, aroma should be rich malt bread. Also a spicy herbal floral hop presence. And that's going to be from the size hops that's typically used in that style. Very delicate. Flavor should be very interesting. It's complex. It's richly malty. It's perceived as slightly sweet, but very, very balanced and somewhat very high on the bitterness end. And 
that's able to be balanced because of the very soft water that's typically used. So it's got a very prominent, smooth bitterness. If you were to objectively measure it, it's probably around the range of 40 IBUs. Some diacetyl, which is that butter flavor, is allowable in, in the style. And if you've had a Pilsner Raquel, it's somewhat pronounced. Medium body, medium carbonation, it should feel like it has something to it. You know, it's not going to be like water. It's not going to be light, but light. There's a little bit of body. There's a little bit of something to it. Overall, a very pleasant experience, and if you get a chance to try one, do it. American Pale Ale, uh, one of the original craft styles here in the States. So the aroma is typically going to be very hoppy. It's typically American hops or New World hops, not really old continental or noble hops by any means. Uh, it's going to be a slight hint of malt, but it should be overwhelming. Generally, we're going to see this towards the side of hoppiness. Flavor, hoppy, balanced towards hops and bitterness with support from the malt. Uh, you're definitely going to get some malt in most cases. Uh, clean fermentation, fermentation characteristics, not a whole lot of fermentation flavor, esters, anything like that. Typically, uh, we would want to see a pretty clean fermentation. And medium body, medium to high carbonation, definitely something there to support those hops. American IPA. This is the craze. Uh, aroma, definitely extremely hoppy. You pour that beer and you take a first whiff, it's going to be hops. Hops, hops, hops. Uh, and it's typically going to be American hops and New World hops, so you know, New Zealand, Australian, some South African. Uh, the fresh hop is going to be apparent from dry hopping. It's that very punchy in the face. Hops, we're there. Uh, malt should be low or in the background and only in support of the hoppiness. But for the most part, the aroma is just going to be in your face, hops. Flavor, extremely hoppy, of course, and bitter. Early American IPAs, West Coast IPAs, intensely bitter. Uh, to the point where they were almost harshly bitter. When you had some beers that are in the range of 100 plus IBUs, and it just, it's a palate wrecker. It ruins whatever else you're going to taste or eat for a while after that. But, it's accentuated, prominent. I would prefer it to be a little more balanced, just because it makes it uh, repeatedly drinkable, but hey, that's not necessarily the style, you know? Clean fermentation characteristics. And the alcohol may be apparent because typically these are going to be on the higher end, 6% plus for the most part. So it's all right for that, that sensation of that alcohol to be there. Medium body, medium to high carbonation, I would probably really want it to be just to be medium. But that body needs to be there to be in support of that bitterness, to be in support of that hop. And we can even break this down as we're seeing more these days, uh, the East Coast versus West Coast. Uh, West Coast focuses on grapefruits, citrus, and orange, and pine and resin forward hops. These are not newer, newer breed hops. These are ones that have been around for a while, Cascade, Chinook, Centennial. Very pine, resin, grapefruit. So malt can also be quite prominent in the West Coast uh, to the point where it's almost amber in color. I've seen some reds, of course, but red IPA is a thing. <clears throat> and it definitely should be in balance. Uh, bitterness is very apparent, definitely a, a very bitter style. And the mouthfeel can be a little light on some of the less malty examples. Typical West Coast IPA, a lot of things that Stone makes are very, very West Coast. Uh, East Coast IPA, or New England IPA, or 
juicy IPA, a hazy IPA, is kind of the, the new thing. Uh, focuses on citrus, more towards orange, tangerine, and tropical fruit, stone fruit. Some berry flavors, which is very interesting, and it's very reminiscent of juice, juicy orange juice, citrus juice in general. The malt should really just be in the background. We're really looking at a, a hop showcase in, in this East Coast. Uh, and the bitterness should be focused on balance if you're even going to bother measuring it all. There are some uh, examples that don't list the bitterness and part of that is because they're not even really boiling hops, they're just doing hop stands on the Whirlpool, which is very interesting. You can get a very smooth and balanced bitterness from only doing Whirlpool hops. Uh, Mouthfeel is a world of difference between the West Coast. It should be soft, pillowy, it should be full with the carbonation. Once you've had a, a good example, you'll understand what that pillowy descriptor means. It's soft, delicate, but it's there. So, some examples would be a lot of what Trillium and Treehouse make. And once you've had an example that is phenomenal, you'll have a little more respect for the style. And it is. Night and day difference as well from West Coast to East Coast, the, the New England IPAs, they're called hazy IPAs for a reason. They are very opaque, they're, they're to the point of turbid looking. Now there shouldn't be any floaties, it should have a consistent haze throughout the beer. There shouldn't be any floaties floating around. I see that as something that should never occur. Irish Stout the opposite direction. So the aroma should be roasted grain, chocolate, coffee. Very, very wonderful flavors. Little to no hop aroma. Now there are some styles of black IPA that really starts to build on the hoppiness in conjunction with these roasted flavors. The flavor, moderate roasted grain, coffee, unsweetened, like a, a, a bitter chocolate, 60% cacao type thing. Not overly roasty. We get a balanced hop bitterness, no hop characteristics, except earthiness and really earthy hops, some English style hops, pair really well with the roastiness and they really accentuate each other. So the roast, we don't want it to be too much. We don't want it to be accurate or, or burnt. We want it to be the nice characteristics of roast, uh, those, those caramel flavors, those roasty chocolate coffee. We don't want it to be smoky, we don't want it to taste burned or scorched. That's just wrong. So the mouthfeel should be kind of creamy with a medium body and low to moderate carbonation. This style is very often uh, served on a nitro tap and what that allows for is much smaller, smoother carbonation, even though it is much lower. Uh, you get a, a mouthfeel that is just like none other. When you pour it on a nitro tap, it is smooth and creamy. <clears throat> Belgian wit beer. So aroma should be mild malt and strong notes of wheat. You should be able to smell the wheat. Under the spices and the fruitiness that are from coriander and the orange peel from the bitter orange peel. Uh, hops should be in the background, really. You just want them kind of playing a supporting role to balance the sweetness from everything. Uh, flavor, you got wheat malt. You should be able to taste the wheat. And a very distinct fruitiness from the coriander and the bitter orange peel. Uh, you should be able to taste both of them. You should be able to differentiate the two. You want them to be in balance, if at all possible. Hot flavor should be low, just to accentuate, accentuate the fruit flavors. And the mouthfeel, kind of similar to the Hazy IP, should be soft and pillowy. Uh, and highly carbonated, and it should be kind of spritzy. It's a very refreshing style. Uh, and unfortunately, the, a lot of the commercial examples that have gained uh, popularity are not very good commercial examples. You'll see, uh, I won't name them, 
just not happy with the very popular Belgian whipped beer examples that are out there. They're not a very good representation of the style. Bar's in, or Oktoberfest, uh, as it was also known in the past. Uh, the aroma should be intensely rich malt with a light bread crust. We're not looking for a whole lot of caramel aroma. It's malt. No hop aroma. The hops should just be there in balance to balance the, the sweetness. And we want a clean lager fermentation profile. Uh, the flavor should be a complex maltiness. You should... It should not be sweet, but it should suggest that the beer is sweet. It should be dry, it should be clean, but the sweetness that is perceived is just from the maltiness. And it should be complex, and it should finish dry. It's wonderful when done correctly. Uh, no hop flavor, bitterness should just balance the malt. Uh, no caramel or roastiness. Those are not correct for this style. Too much caramel, too much roast, you, you've gone the wrong direction. Mouthful, mouthfeel should be medium with a creaminess that suggests a fuller body, but it should be dry, refreshing, repeatable. Hefeweizen or vice beer. The aroma, we have a, a strong balance of phenols and esters, so clove and banana, those are the typical flavors of a, of a good Hefeweizen. Clove and banana, right, right there. And the wheat, kind of similar to the Belgian wheat beer, the wheat should be apparent. You should know that it's a wheat beer. There should be no hop aroma. Flavor, moderate to strong balance of clove and banana. Some styles do lean more one side of banana or one side of clove. You really want them to be balanced. You want to be able to pick them out individually, but you want them to be about the same level. And complementary wheat flavor. So that wheat is going to be there and it really ties together the other two main flavors. So no hop flavor, bitterness is low. It's a very spritzy, highly carbonated, effervescent style. Very refreshing in the summer. Any time of the year, really. But definitely, you're going to get a good pillowy body from, from the wheat in general as well. And also the yeast that, that stays supposed to stay in suspension. So we got some of the newer unclassified styles, and this will probably change when they update their guidelines. Uh, some kettle sours you'll see have really exploded in popularity. Uh, Berliner Weiss and Goza are your traditional German styles uh, soured. Uh, and we got American kettle sours that have really exploded in popularity, and unfortunately smoothie sours. Uh, so these things are soured in the kettle using typically lactobacillus bacteria and then boiled to kill it off. So it's generally safe to make within um, rotation of regular beers in the brew house and, and cellar, whereas wild sours are very dangerous. You can introduce infections on yourself. Uh, fun beers can be a lot of fun. It can be very refreshing. Uh, I'm sure we'll start to see more guidelines as the, the style has developed more and more, but really I don't know how they're going to because it's such a wide range. There's different fruits that are added. There's lactose and vanilla that can be added to really make it a, like a dream sickle type thing. It's very interesting to see where it's headed. And they sell very well. And then we've got pastry beers. So pastry stouts and pastry sours as well. And what you're seeing there are high adjuncts, coconut, chocolate, lactose, things that tastes like dessert in a glass. Uh, I had one one time that it was advertised as a cherry turnover, and I tell you what, it took a drink, and wouldn't you know it, it tasted like a cherry turnover. I was thoroughly impressed. Uh, not what I was expecting at the start out. It was, it was interesting, to say the least. And these things, we'll, I'm sure we'll start to see a little more objective guidelines for what people have decided on, what should this style uh, settle at. So style accuracy, brewing to style, should you want to do that. Uh, that is a, a way to describe your brewery. If you brew to style, you 
are brewing to specific set style guidelines. Um, another thing that style guidelines do is they provide your customers with a reasonable expectation of what they're getting themselves into. Uh, so if you deviate from the style guidelines, make sure you inform them on the label or on the description. Uh, if you put a ton of fruit in a Hefeweizen, you don't tell the customer that they're going to be very confused when they go to take a drink and they get all kinds of fruit. So you want to make sure you're just informing the customer so they have a general idea. If you just label it a half of ice and they're going to go into that thinking clove and banana, a little bit of wheat, uh, and you hit them with a bunch of raspberry, they're going to be surprised, number one, because it's going to look pink. Uh, number two, it's going to taste different. And then uh, bring the style and also bring for competition. Not necessarily, uh, they're, they're different than brewing for customer expectations. So brewing to style might not necessarily meet your customer's expectations. If your customers want fruity, fruity, fruity out the wazoo, it's going to be hard to sell them on a Marzen that's brewed to a traditional style. Possibly. Yeah, you might, they might surprise you. But competitions are usually judged based on style guidelines, whether it be uh, BJCP or Brewers Association style guidelines. Uh, those are two of the most common ones. I'm sure there are more out there. Europeans, I'm sure, have their own. So we get in a little more objective evaluation to hit our, our targeted styles. So color, uh, SRM or standard reference method, uh, grades beer and color from 1 to 40. American Light Lager is one of the lowest ones at 2 to 3, higher stout, one of the highest ones at 25 to 40. Uh, sometimes it can be used interchangeably with the degrees level bond, which is the older way of doing it. And then the Europeans have their own, trying to be uh, consistent from uh, area to area. Uh, European Beer Convention is SRM basically multiplied by 2 in the numbers at least. And every style's got its own SRM target range. And we'll see here just a range of color from lightest to darkest. And that's how the beers are going to be evaluated. Now, how you can uh, evaluate your own beer based on how it looks versus a white background. So you want to pour a little bit into glass, put it up against a white background, piece of paper if you got a white wall, uh, and judge it basically. Got objective valuation for bitterness, IBU, International Bitterness Units. Uh, it's an objective measure of isomerized alpha acids derived from hops. Uh, this is obtained objectively through spectrophotometric analysis or a calculated estimation. Uh, unless you send your beer off to get evaluated or if you have a spectrophotometer in house you're going to be calculating it based off of equations either through software or you get out the pen and paper and do the math yourself. So it ranges uh, from two to three IBUs and like some of the kettle sours you only got two or three IBUs just enough to really inhibit bacterial growth uh, post packaging. And then as we talked about in the American IPA category you've got some that are 100 plus And with that being said, there is some subjectiveness to that objective measure. Uh, the subjectiveness being the human palate. You, know, you can objectively measure things, quantify it with a number, and five people can taste it completely differently. Uh, so generally, the human palate cannot differentiate a difference of about five IBUs. It's, for the most part, a beer bitter to 30 IBU and a beer bitter to 35 IBU if they are equal otherwise than that, most people are going to say they are identical. Most. Some can differentiate, most can't. And in my opinion, IBU is becoming less and less standard because the more we research hops, the more we research beer flavors in general, the more we realize it's a lot more complicated than we ever thought it was. 40 IBUs calculated with one hop is going to taste completely different 40 IBUs calculated with a different hop. And 
part of that is because of the polyphenol concentration within the hop. And that can play a huge role. If you bitter with a hop that has a low polyphenol concentration, it is going to taste not nearly as harsh as a hop that has a higher polyphenol concentration. So it's more than just the perceived bitterness is more than just IBU or isomerized alpha acids. And then we got objective evaluation for uh, sugar content, specific gravity, uh, Plato and bricks, degrees Plato, degrees bricks. They were all measures of density, either directly or indirectly. Uh, specific gravity measures density relative to a distilled water reference. Uh, one being water, and anything less than one is less dense, and anything greater than one is more dense. It is a unitless number, so you get specific gravity, and it's described as 1.012. Uh, everything in the scientific world, units, units, units. If you don't list your units, I don't know what you're talking about, unless you're talking about specific gravity. Plato is a measurement of the weight of dissolved solids, red as degrees Plato. Uh, really has become the most commonly used gravity reading. Uh, I don't want to say industry standard because a lot of people don't use it, but a lot of big breweries, this is what they're going to be reading and reporting in. Uh, bricks is a measurement of the dissolved sugar in solution. It's red as degrees bricks. Bricks is more in line with the carbonated soda beverage industry and sugar, candy. Uh, things like that are measured in degrees bricks. Uh, Plato and bricks have a very similar scale and they generally can be used interchangeably. Uh, the only time it really gets kind of hairy is when you start getting higher up. Uh, and in general, to convert between Plato or bricks and specific gravity, you'll multiply the Plato reading by four to get the last digits of your specific gravity. So, for example, I've got on here uh, 12 degrees Plato is about 1.048 in specific gravity. So you're taking that 12, you're multiplying by four, and it'll get you very close, close enough that in conversation with someone, it's, it's good enough. Anything other than conversation, I would make sure just measure it. If you really need to know specific gravity, if you really need to know Plato, just measure it. And then what we have here is the bitterness units to gravity units uh, table. And it's a general measure of how malty something is versus how hoppy something is when evaluated between your original gravity, so before you have started uh, fermentation, and your IBUs. And generally you'll see red is red or brown is the, the multi side, branching all the way over to the intense green, which is very hoppy. And I don't use this a whole lot, but sometimes you'll see this in description of, of styles or in uh, specific beers in general. 